Okay, moving on uh, swiftly to our first keynote speaker, uh, Richard uh, Barrington. Uh, Richard launched the world's first sustainable computing campaign in 2005 while at Sun Microsystems. He's a member of her, His Royal Highness's Corporate Leaders Group on Climate Change, the CBI's Climate Change Task Force, the, <laughs> it's a long list, the CBI's Environment Panel, as well as the Science, Technology and Innovation Panel. An active alumni of the Cambridge University Business and Environment Programme, Richard lives a low... <laughs> Richard lives a low-carbon lifestyle and makes amazing jam <laughs> and chutney and slow gin. It gets better towards the end. Uh, um, right, so by combining industrial standard technology, next generation liquid cooling, uh, Isotope delivers a low-energy, low-impact solution that's been designed, engineered and manufactured in the UK using cradle-to-cradle -cradle principles and the highest levels of environmental stewardship. Please welcome Richard Barrington from Isotope. <laughs> Amazing. Didn't even have to press the button myself. I must be important. Thank you so much. Um, so I've got exactly seven minutes. I've promised to do it in six minutes, 38 seconds, so you can all time me. Um, I promised somebody last night that there would be no penguins in my presentation and uh, no bullet points either. Uh, I lied on the last one. There's just one set of bullet points, but hopefully they'll forgive me. The challenge we face is a thing called Jevron's paradox, and this is that as we make things more efficient, what typically happens is we consume more of it. Because as we make it more efficient, the price point comes down, more people can come into the market and buy and so on and consume. And as you can see, this is me um, now, rather than then. I was nine stone uh, in uh, 1990, and my television usually weighed more than I did, and now it is the exact opposite. And of course, the thing is, in 1990, you might have had one television in your house, now, how many have you got? Uh, they've become cheaper, they've become more, and so we have them all over our house in the bedroom. Some people have their ch allow their children to have them. So consumption has actually increased over that period while we have created a more efficient environment and a more efficient product. And what's actually happened at the back of that is energy uh, the uh, consumption of energy has just gone through the roof. And as we project into the developing countries, the BRIC nations, we see worldwide energy consumption continuing to soar and that gives us a whole series of problems. I don't know what your idea of a power station is. Uh, we have some quite attractive ones in this country and we have some not so attractive ones. But the reality is we don't have enough. And all the projections from 2015 onwards suggest that we're going to have rolling brownouts across the country because we can't produce enough energy to power the consumption that we're currently all engaged in, and that includes myself. And Part of that has been fueled by an explosion within IT of new devices, of new services, of social media, of new ways of interacting, all the different things we want to do. And of course, this thing called cloud. Um, Amazon alone for their cloud service have 450,000 servers supporting their cloud service. Google won't say how many servers they've got. They see it as a trade secret. But current estimates put it around 2 million just so you can search the internet. Uh, this gives us some headaches, including the UK has actually become a world leader in data centers. Uh, we have more per head of population than anywhere else on the planet, and the power consumed by those data centers is equivalent of 6 million households. Okay, 6.4 gigawatts just to power computers, and those are the ones that responded to the survey. And I'm sure there are, in all of your university campuses, in some little dusty corner, a supercomputer that is forever turned on, uh, probably forgotten about, but actually doing, uh, making its contribution to these kinds of numbers. <coughs> and of course, every data center uh, offer that's made to you, and we're going to build you a beautiful data center, looks like that. The reality, of course, is a little more uh, prosaic, <laughs> um, because it is complex. Those data centers equate to around 7 million square meters of floor space in this country of ours, which of course we've got lots of land, lots of space, so it, it doesn't matter, does it? Um, and of course, alongside that, you have massive amounts of M&E, me mechanical, electrical stuff, chillers, coolers, air conditioning units, humidity control systems, power supplies in, UPSs, backup generators, and so on. This is actually Microsoft's attempt at a passive air cooling system. So this is in one of their car parks. It's actually only got um, about a dozen servers in there, and that's what they had to build to actually get it to be naturally air-cooled 
Um, it, it's not exactly an uh, attractive piece of engineering, I, I, I think you'll agree. So what's happened is the industry's come up with, we've got to have standards, standards, standards. Of course, the standards were actually created by the industry, so there are certain things that are sacrosanct, like uh, the actual amount of compute you have is always one. Okay, and then everything else gets added on top. So whether you reduce your compute footprint is always one, because we don't really want you to reduce your compute footprint because we want to sell you more computers. So that doesn't help. What does help is people coming up with alternative solutions. Um, you've got to think differently. It's the whole target of sustainability is to get people to think differently, to recognize the, the, the way that everything is interconnected and that if I do something here, it has an impact there. How do we actually get people to have the courage to think differently? Uh, of course, some people have these really crazy ideas, ones that you would never dream of would ever be reality, and therefore we should just move swiftly on. So here's a, here's a challenge for you. If you burn yourself, do you stand there going, or do you put your hand under a tap? Anybody blow or anybody tap? Who taps? You all tap. Now, isn't that funny? So why would you then blow air across a really hot computer to cool it? Um, it doesn't kind of make sense to me. So let's get rid of, because it's a pretty grisly picture for this time in the morning, and let's look at why we should be actually doing liquid cooling. It, it actually is incredibly more efficient and effective at capturing heat and moving it away from hot things like electronics. So our aim as a business is to deliver free cooling <coughs> for IT anywhere on the planet. And it's an engineering problem, it's not an IT problem, although we use lots of IT at, at Leeds University to do some of the uh, fluid dynamics and modeling that go into our product. So what I'm gonna do is just leave you with five questions because I'm almost out of time already. And I know you're all excited, you want me to stay on for more? <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. No, that was the other speaker saying that. So, um, so the questions that we're trying to address is, is it possible to build a computer system that no longer requires all of that stuff. And I've put this picture up because we believe that you can actually take one of our systems and if you can plug in a coffee machine, you can plug in one of our systems. It's totally silent in operation. You can actually have it next to your desk or in the office or wherever you want it to be because we don't blow air. I blow a lot of hot air, but that's uh, a totally different uh, problem. Can we create computing that is truly sustainable? I don't believe that anything ever can be because it always has some kind of impact whether it's at a resource end or at a disposal end, but can we build systems that will last for so long that we can recover them and reuse them, not recycle them, reuse them time after time after time, and then use environmentally sustainable products and manufacturing techniques to actually deliver that? Can we actually cut 97% of the energy consumption of that cooling system? Is it possible to halve the energy consumption of IT and reduce the amount of money that's spent on all the other stuff? Because what's amazing is people want to have a computer to do something and then they have to have all these other things just so the computer will work. The building, the air conditioning, the raised floor, and so on and so forth. Is it possible to actually cool 20 kilowatts of computing using the energy of a light bulb? Can we build systems that will operate in any significantly hostile environment? Very hostile environment. <laughs> my, daughter, my, my wife works. <laughs> and actually, can we do that in the United Kingdom using our in information, our talent, our engineering capability, our manufacturing resources? And if you want to find out the answer, come and visit us on the isotope stand. Thank you.